Chapter 7 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 7 Love. Every man on this planet is taking his initiation in love. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Ospensky states, in Tertium Organum, that love is a cosmic phenomenon, and opens to man the fourth-dimensional world, the world of the wondrous. Real love is selfish and free from fear. It pours itself out upon the object of its affection, without demanding any return. Its joy is in the joy of giving. Love is God in manifestation, and the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Pure, unselfish love draws to itself its own. It does not need to seek or demand. Scarcely anyone has the faintest conception of real love. Man is selfish, tyrannical, or fearful in his affections, thereby losing the things he loves. Jealousy is the worst enemy of love, for the imagination runs riot, seeing the loved one attracted to another, and invariably these fears objectify if they are not neutralized. For example, a woman came to me in deep distress. The man she loved had left her for another woman, and said he never intended to marry her. She was torn with jealousy and resentment, and said she hoped he would suffer as he had made her suffer, and added, How could he leave me when I loved him so much? I replied, You are not loving that man, you are hating him, and added, You can never receive what you have never given. Give a perfect love, and you will receive a perfect love. Perfect yourself on this man. Give him a perfect, unselfish love, demanding nothing in return. Do not criticize or condemn, and bless him wherever he is. She replied, No, I won't bless him unless I know where he is. Well, I said, that is not real love. When you send out real love, real love will return to you either from this man or his equivalent for if this man is not the divine selection you will not want him as you are one with god you are one with the love which belongs to you by divine right several months passed and matters remained about the same but she was working conscientiously within herself i said when you are no longer disturbed by his cruelty he will cease to be cruel as you are attracting it through your own emotions then i told her of a brotherhood in india who never said good morning to each other they used these words i salute the divinity in you they saluted the divinity in every man and in the wild animals in the jungle and they were never harmed for they saw only god in every living thing i said salute the divinity in this man and say i see your divine self only i see you as god sees you perfect made in his image and likeness she found she was becoming more poised and gradually losing her resentment he was a captain and she always called him the cap one day she said suddenly god bless the cap wherever he is i replied now that is real love and when you have become a complete circle and are no longer disturbed by the situation you will have his love or attract its equivalent i was moving at this time and did not have a telephone so was out of touch with her for a few weeks when one morning i received a letter saying we are married at the earliest opportunity i paid her a call my first words were what happened oh she exclaimed a miracle one day i woke up and all suffering had ceased 
i saw him that evening and he asked me to marry him we were married in about a week and i have never seen a more devoted man there is an old saying no man is your enemy no man is your friend every man is your teacher so one should become impersonal and learn what each man has to teach him and soon he would learn his lessons and be free the woman's lover was teaching her selfish love which every man sooner or later must learn suffering is not necessary for man's development it is the result of violation of spiritual law but few people seem able to rouse themselves from their soul sleep without it when people are happy they usually become selfish and automatically the law of karma is set in action man often suffers loss through lack of appreciation i knew a woman who had a very nice husband but she said often i don't care anything about being married but that is nothing against my husband i'm simply not interested in married life she had other interests and scarcely remembered she had a husband she only thought of him when she saw him one day her husband told her he was in love with another woman and left she came to me in distress and resentment i replied it is exactly what you spoke the word for you said you didn't care anything about being married so the subconscious worked to get you unmarried she said oh yes i see people get what they want and then feel very much hurt she soon became in perfect harmony with the situation and knew they were both much happier apart when a woman becomes indifferent or critical and ceases to be an inspiration to her husband he misses the stimulus of their early relationship and is restless and unhappy a man came to me dejected miserable and poor his wife was interested in the science of numbers and had had him read it seems the report was not very favorable for he said my wife says i'll never amount to anything because i am a two i replied i don't care what your number is you are a perfect idea in divine mind and we will demand the success and prosperity which are already planned for you by that infinite intelligence within a few weeks he had a very fine position and a year or two later he achieved a brilliant success as a writer no man is a success in business unless he loves his work the picture the artist paints for love of his art is his greatest work the pot boiler is always something to live down no man can attract money if he despises it many people are kept in poverty by saying money means nothing to me i have a contempt for people who have it this is the reason so many artists are poor their contempt for money separates them from it i remember hearing one artist say of another he's no good as an artist but he has money in the bank this attitude of mind of course separates man from his supply he must be in harmony with a thing in order to attract it money is god in manifestation as freedom from want and limitation but it must be always kept in circulation and put to right uses hoarding and saving react with grim vengeance this does not mean that man should not have houses and lots stocks and bonds for the barns of the righteous man shall be full it means that man should not hoard even the principle if an occasion arises when money is necessary in letting it go out fearlessly and cheerfully he opens the way for more to come in for god is man's unfailing and unexhaustible supply this is the spiritual attitude towards money and the great bank of the universal never fails we see an example of hoarding in the film production of greed the woman won five thousand dollars in a lottery but would not spend it she hoarded and saved let her husband suffer and starve and eventually she scrubbed floors for a living she loved the money itself and put it above everything and one night she was murdered and the money taken from her this is an example of where 
Love of money is the root of all evil. Money in itself is good and beneficial, but used for destructive purposes, hoarded and saved, or considered more important than love, brings disease and disaster, and the loss of the money itself. Follow the path of love, and all things are added, for God is love, and God is supply. Follow the path of selfishness and greed, and the supply vanishes, or man is separated from it. For example, I knew the case of a very rich woman who hoarded her income. She rarely gave anything away, but bought and bought and bought things for herself. She was very fond of necklaces, and a friend once asked her how many she possessed. She replied, Sixty-seven. She bought them and put them away, carefully wrapped in tissue paper had she used the necklaces it would have been quite legitimate but she was violating the law of use her closets were filled with clothes she never wore and jewels which never saw the light the old woman's arms were gradually becoming paralyzed from holding on to things and eventually she was considered incapable of looking after her affairs and her wealth was handed over to others to manage so man in ignorance of the law brings about his own destruction. All disease, all unhappiness, come from the violation of the law of love. Man's boomerangs of hate, resentment, and criticism come back laden with sickness and sorrow. Love seems almost a lost art, but the man with the knowledge of spiritual law knows it must be regained, for without it he has become as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. For example, I had a student who came to me, month after month, to clean her consciousness of resentment. After a while, she arrived at the point where she resented only one woman, but that one woman kept her busy. Little by little, she became poised and harmonious, and one day, all resentment was wiped out. She came in radiant and exclaimed, You can't understand how I feel. The woman said something to me, and instead of being furious, I was loving and kind. And she apologized and was perfectly lovely to me. No one can understand the marvelous lightness I feel within. Love and goodwill are invaluable in business. For example, a woman came to me complaining of her employer. She said she was cold and critical, and she knew she did not want her in the position. Well, I replied, salute the divinity in the woman and send her love. She said, I can't. She's a marble woman. I answered, you remember the story of the sculptor who asked for a certain piece of marble? He was asked why he wanted it, and he replied, Because there is an angel in the marble. And out of it he produced a wonderful work of art. She said, Very well, I'll try it. A week later she came back and said, I did what you told me, and now the woman is very kind, and took me out in her car. People are sometimes filled with remorse for having done someone an unkindness, perhaps years ago. If the wrong cannot be righted, its effect can be neutralized by doing someone a kindness in the present. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Sorrow, regret, and remorse tear down the cells of the body and poison the atmosphere of the individual a woman said to me in deep sorrow treat me to be happy and joyous for my sorrow makes me so irritable with the members of my family that i keep making more karma i was asked to treat a woman who was mourning for her daughter i denied all belief in loss and separation and affirmed that god was the woman's joy love and peace the woman gained her poise at once but sent word by her son not to treat any longer because she was so happy it wasn't respectable so mortal mind 
loves to hang on to its griefs and regrets. I knew a woman who went about bragging of her troubles, so, of course, she always had something to brag about. The old idea was, if a woman did not worry about her children, she was not a good mother. Now we know that mother fear is responsible for many of the diseases and accidents which come into the lives of children. For fear pictures vividly the disease or situation feared, and these pictures objectify if not neutralized happy is the mother who can say sincerely that she puts her child in god's hands and therefore knows that he is divinely protected for example a woman awoke suddenly in the night feeling her brother was in great danger instead of giving in to her fears she commenced making statements of truth saying man is a perfect idea in divine mind and is always in his right place therefore my brother is in his right place and is divinely protected the next day she found that her brother had been in close proximity to an explosion in a mine but had miraculously escaped so man is his brother's keeper in thought and every man should know that the thing he loves dwells in the secret place of the most high and abides under the shadow of the almighty there shall no evil befall thee neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling perfect love casteth out fear he that feareth is not made perfect in love and love is the fulfilling of the law end of chapter seven recording by amy conger Chapter 8 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 8 Intuition or Guidance. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There is nothing too great of accomplishment for the man who knows the power of his word, and who follows his intuitive leads. By the word he starts in action unseen forces, and can rebuild his body or remould his affairs. It is, therefore, of the utmost importance to choose the right words, and the student carefully selects the affirmation he wishes to catapult into the invisible. He knows that God is his supply, and that there is a supply for every demand, and that his spoken word releases this supply. Ask, and ye shall receive. Man must make the first move. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I have often been asked just how to make a demonstration. I reply, speak the word and then do not do anything until you get a definite lead. Demand the lead, saying, Infinite Spirit, reveal to me the way. Let me know if there's anything for me to do. The answer will come through intuition, or hunch, a chance remark from someone, or a passage in a book, etc., etc. The answers are sometimes quite startling in their exactness. For example, a woman desired a large sum of money. She spoke the words, Infinite Spirit, open the way for my immediate supply. Let all that is mine by divine right now reach me in great avalanches of abundance. Then she added, Give me a definite lead. Let me know if there is anything for me to do. The thought came quickly. Give a certain friend, who had helped her spiritually, a hundred dollars. She told her friend, who said, Wait and get another lead before giving it. So she waited, and that day met a woman who said to her, I gave someone a dollar today. It was just as much for me as it would be for you to give someone a hundred. This was indeed an unmistakable lead, so she knew she was right in giving the hundred dollars. It was a gift which proved a great investment for shortly after that. A large sum of money came to her in a remarkable way. 
giving opens the way for receiving in order to create activity in finances one should give tithing or giving one-tenth of one's income is an old jewish custom and is sure to bring increase many of the richest men in the country have been tithers and have never known it to fail as an investment the tenth part goes forth and returns blessed and multiplied but the gift or tithe must be given with love and cheerfulness for god loveth a cheerful giver bills should be paid cheerfully all money should be sent forth fearlessly and with a blessing this attitude of mind makes man master of money it is his to obey and his spoken word then opens vast reservoirs of wealth man himself limits his supply by his limited vision sometimes the student has a great realization of wealth but is afraid to act the vision and action must go hand in hand as in the case of the man who bought the fur-lined overcoat a woman came to me asking me to speak the word for a position so i demanded infinite spirit open the way for this woman's right position never ask for just a position ask for the right position the place already planned in divine mind as it is the only one that will give satisfaction i then gave thanks that she had already received and that it would manifest quickly very soon she had three positions offered her two in new york and one in palm beach and she did not know which one to choose i said ask for a definite lead the time was almost up and was still undecided when one day she telephoned when i woke up this morning i could smell palm beach she had been there before and knew its balmy fragrance i replied well if you can smell palm beach from here it's certainly your lead she accepted the position and it proved a great success often one's lead comes at an unexpected time one day i was walking down the street when suddenly i felt a strong urge to go to a certain bakery a block or two away the reasoning mind resisted arguing there is nothing there that you want however i had learned not to reason so i went to the bakery looked at everything and there was certainly nothing there that i wanted but coming out i encountered a woman i had thought of often and who was in great need of the help which i could give her so often one goes for one thing and finds another intuition is a spiritual faculty and does not explain but simply points the way a person often receives a lead during a treatment the idea that comes may seem quite irrelevant but some of god's leadings are mysterious in the class one day i was treating that each individual would receive a definite lead a woman came to me afterwards and said while you were treating i got the hunch to take my furniture out of storage and get an apartment the woman had come to be treated for health i told her i knew in getting a home of her own her health would improve and i added i believe your trouble which is a congestion has come from having things stored away congestion of things causes congestion in the body you have violated the law of use and your body is paying the penalty so i gave thanks that divine order was established in her mind body and affairs people little dream of how their affairs react on the body there is a mental correspondence for every disease a person might receive instantaneous healing through the realization of his body being a perfect idea in divine mind and therefore whole and perfect but if he continues his destructive thinking hoarding hating fearing condemning the disease will return jesus christ knew that all sickness came from sin but admonished the leper after the healing to go and sin no more lest a worse thing come upon him so man's soul or subconscious mind must be washed whiter than snow for permanent healing 
and the metaphysician is always delving deep for the correspondence. Jesus Christ said, Condemn not, lest ye also be condemned. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Many people have attracted disease and unhappiness through the condemnation of others. What man condemns in others, he attracts to himself. For example, a friend came to me in anger and distress because her husband had deserted her for another woman. She condemned the other woman and said continually, She knew he was a married man. She had no right to accept his attentions. I replied, Stop condemning the woman. Bless her and be through with the situation. Otherwise, you are attracting the same thing to yourself. She was deaf to my words, and a year or two later became deeply interested in a married man herself. Man picks up a live wire whenever he criticizes or condemns, and may expect a shock. Indecision is a stumbling block in many a pathway. In order to overcome it, make the statement repeatedly, I am always under direct inspiration. I make right decisions quickly. These words impress the subconscious, and soon one finds himself awake and alert, making his right moves without hesitation. I have found it destructive to look to the psychic plane for guidance, as it is the plane of many minds and not the one mind. As man opens his mind to subjectivity, he becomes a target for destructive forces. The psychic plane is the result of man's mortal thought, and is on the plane of opposites. He may receive either good or bad messages. The science of numbers and the reading of horoscopes keep man down the mental or mortal plane, for they deal only with the karmic path. I know of a man who should have been dead years ago, according to his horoscope, but he is alive and a leader of one of the biggest movements in this country for the uplift of humanity. It takes a very strong mind to neutralize a prophecy of evil. The student should declare, Every false prophecy shall come to naught. Every plan my Father in heaven has not planned shall be dissolved and dissipated. The divine idea now comes to pass. However, if any good message has ever been given one of coming happiness or wealth, harbor and expect it, and it will manifest sooner or later through the law of expectancy. Man's will should be used to back the universal will. I will that the will of God be done. It is God's will to give every man every righteous desire of his heart, and man's will should be used to hold the perfect vision without wavering. The prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father. It is indeed often an effort of the will to leave the husks and swine of mortal thinking. It is so much easier for the average person to have fear than faith. So faith is an effort of the will. As man becomes spiritually awakened, he recognizes that any external inharmony is the correspondence of mental inharmony. If he stumbles or falls, he may know he is stumbling or falling in consciousness. One day a student was walking along the street, condemning someone in her thoughts. She was saying mentally, that woman is the most disagreeable woman on earth when suddenly three Boy Scouts rushed around the corner and almost knocked her over. She did not condemn the Boy Scouts, but immediately called on the law of forgiveness and saluted the divinity in the woman. Wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. When one has made his demands upon the universal, he must be ready for surprises. Everything may seem to be going wrong, when in reality it is going right. For example, a woman was told that there was no loss in divine mind, therefore she could not lose anything which belonged to her. 
anything lost would be returned, or she would receive its equivalent. Several years previously she had lost two thousand dollars. She had loaned the money to a relative during her lifetime, but the relative had died, leaving no mention of it in her will. The woman was resentful and angry, and as she had no written statement of the transaction, she never received the money, so she determined to deny the loss and collect the two thousand dollars from the Bank of the Universal she had to begin by forgiving the woman as resentment and unforgiveness closed the door of this wonderful bank she made this statement i deny loss there is no loss in divine mind therefore i cannot lose the two thousand dollars which belong to me by divine right as one door shuts another opens she was living in an apartment house which was for sale and in the lease was a clause stating that if the house was sold the tenants would be required to move out within ninety days suddenly the landlord broke the leases and raised the rent again injustice was on her pathway but this time she was undisturbed she blessed the landlord and said as the rent has been raised it means that i'll be that much richer for god is my supply the new leases were made out for the advanced rent but by some divine mistake the ninety-day clause had been forgotten soon after the landlord had an opportunity to sell the house on account of the mistake in the new leases the tenants held possession for another year the agent offered each tenant two hundred dollars if he would vacate several families moved three remained including the woman a month or two passed, and the agent again appeared. This time he said to the woman, "'Will you break your lease for the sum of fifteen hundred dollars?' It flashed upon her. "'Here comes the two thousand dollars.' She remembered having said to friends in the house, "'We will all act together if anything more is said about leaving.' So her lead was to consult her friends. These friends said, "'Well, if they have offered you fifteen hundred, they will certainly give two thousand so she received a check for two thousand dollars for giving up the apartment it was certainly a remarkable working of the law and the apparent injustice was merely an opening for the way for her demonstration it proved that there is no loss and when man takes his spiritual stand he collects all that is his from this great reservoir of good I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. The locusts are the doubts, fears, resentments, and regrets of mortal thinking. These adverse thoughts alone rob man, for no man gives to himself but himself, and no man takes away from himself but himself. Man is here to prove God and to bear witness to the truth and he can only prove god by bringing plenty out of lack and justice out of injustice prove me now herewith saith the lord of hosts if i will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall be not room enough to receive it end of chapter eight recording by amy conger Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.